If you ever happen to have a discussion with someone regarding the CDI, it's almost certainly going to revolve around the terrible and often mocked Nintendo games released on the system. It's rather unfortunate because when the CDI was active, these were seen more as a novelty, whereas the real discussion revolved around a handful of incredible ports and exclusive games such as Thunder and Paradise, Mutant Rampage Body Slam, and Burn Cycle. Philips CDI was brutally expensive at launch, costing $699, and that didn't include gamepads or costly hardware add-ons required for some games. The main issue with the initial console is it wasn't designed or marketed as a standalone gaming system, nor did they actively try to pursue video games as a selling point for the CDI until it was past its prime. The end result is a console that's mostly misunderstood and defined by games for their comedic badness rather than an appreciation for its positive offerings. Though the CDI debuted in 1991, the price was slow to drop until 1994 when it was finally slashed to $299. The last official game, Star Crusade, released in 1998, giving a great lifespan to a system oftentimes cited as a failure due to the reported $1 billion loss Philips took on the project as a whole. With such a long lifespan, it seems almost inconceivable there would only be a handful of unreleased games on the hardware. However, after looking over every bit of the very limited sources that covered the system while it was active, it appears that's the case. A big part of that comes down to the lack of any support and Philips handling responsibility for the vast majority of software released on the system, including ports of big budget titles such as Seventh Guest. So enjoy this one shot and be sure to let me know what you think when it's done. There are a couple things to note before we get started. I will not be discussing any edutainment or non-video game related titles that remain unreleased for the system. The rules for inclusion are simple. The game had to be developed while the system was still supported and under official license from Philips. There has to be some proof that the game was in development, be it an article in a magazine, known copy of a prototype, a retail order sheet, an interview with a developer, etc. With that, let's get started. This is Retro Impressions Unreleased CDI. Ask a fan of the CDI what their top 10 games for the system are, and it's almost guaranteed none of the Zelda releases will be on it, but The Apprentice will. It was a typical 90s platformer with a humorous story tossed in. A sequel was put into development with art and a demo created to serve as a proof of concept. By the time the game was ready to expand to a full team, Philips was winding down the CDI and cancelled The Apprentice 2. I think it's worth noting that the original Apprentice was once again being discussed a decade later due to someone discovering passwords within the game that unlocked nudity. While that might not seem out of order on a system such as the CDI or 3DO, this was nudity inside of a game that was initially rated E for everyone by the newly established ESRB. In August of 1994, a deal was announced between Philips and Interplay to bring three games to the CDI, Battle Chess, Lost Vikings, and a still unknown title. Battle Chess was chosen because Interplay felt it would be a cheap and easy game to move from the PC to the CDI. The project was handed off to a Philips studio called Accent Media who had prior experience with the system releasing Joker's Wild and its sequel. Months were invested in producing a complete game that ran slowly on the hardware, exhibiting some odd bugs. Like many Mahjong and chess games, the engine the game was built on came from an outside source, making it nearly impossible to optimize for the CDI's specific needs. The game was canceled two weeks from going gold as Philips closed down their Santa Monica branch and the development houses associated with them. The nearly finished prototype was eventually found, but remains undumped. Not much is known about the Lost Vikings port or if it was even started, but it's assumed to have been canceled as part of the Santa Monica closure as well. In the end, the Interplay deal resulted in zero games being released. Breaker was a well-known MSX breakout clone that was ported to the CDI in 1994 by the Vision Factory. It's unknown why it never released and beyond a few screenshots, nothing else has been found. In addition to Breaker, the same studio also started development on another port of the shooter Scramble, one that also remains lost with only one screenshot remaining. In 1995, Philips showed Dead End for the CDI at E3. It was touted as their new killer app, one that would boost sales and extend the life of their dying system. The game was a full motion video racing experience that featured a new tech called continuously variable frame rates. This allowed the player to speed up or slow down the car while the FMV background kept pace. The tech proved hard to implement on the aging hardware, so the variable frame rate was dropped a gun mounted to the car, and it was turned into a shooting while driving action game. Dead End transformed from a system seller to something mundane and was eventually cancelled due to this reason. 
Discworld on the CDI caused quite the controversy on its way to becoming an unreleased CDI game. It was announced for the system in 1995, and leading up to its release, a rave review appeared in the UK version of CDI Magazine, issue 18. The game was touted as a must-buy and would be releasing very soon. Not appearing on the same page was a footnote about the review. At the time of going to press, the CDI version of Discworld was in the final beta testing stages of development. We therefore had to use the PC version of the game for this review. According to our sources though, both versions play identically, the only differences occurring in the speed of the game as a whole, and a few cutbacks and background animations on the CDI version. If there's anything else, we'll let you know. What? How could any reputable publication allow this to happen? While people continued to focus on this review over the next decade, the real story has become the game's disappearance. No one seems to know why the game was never released, and unfortunately, a prototype has never been found. Microcosm was considered a fairly technical game when it released in 1993, so it's no wonder that Philips would push hard to get it on the CDI. As with nearly every game ported to the CDI, Philips took full responsibility for porting the game and assigned it to their freelance studio. The game would continue development in Dorking, England into 1994 when Philips started closing down projects and consolidating their development houses. Microcosm actually survived the cut and was moved back to America to finish development. Porting the game proved to be extremely problematic, pushing its release back into 1995. By the time the project was wrapping up, Philips decided the market had shifted and would no longer accept the game like Microcosm, so it was cancelled. Space Ranger looks to be some sort of side-scrolling shooter. I say looks to be because there really isn't any info out there on this game describing what it is. Its existence was actually unknown until Good Deal Games and older games obtained an alpha build and released a limited pressing to the public. The demo contains only one level and was developed in-house by Studio Interactive. Why it was cancelled or never announced is unknown. While Philips' overall relationship with Nintendo tainted the CDI's reputation with the release of questionable games, one was actually met with a lukewarm reception. Hotel Mario was the start of what Philips saw as a Mario trilogy of sorts. Three games were put into development by different studios hired by Philips to produce something unique. Each game was to focus on a completely different style of interaction with high hopes that one would become a hit. The first to release was Hotel Mario, a puzzle game about keeping doors closed. The second title scheduled for release was Super Mario's Wacky Worlds, developed by Nova Logic. The game was designed as a sequel to Super Mario World on the Super Nintendo, with the main change being the setting of each level would not revisit any area from prior games. Philips allocated a healthy budget for the game, and Nova Trade in turn used that money to fund unrelated projects they intended to publish themselves. The Mario game was left with a skeleton crew, allowing them to show Philips some progression was being made whenever they sent their representative to check on things. The hardware was a pain to work on, with limitations that severely held back progression. Even Yoshi had to be cut from the game, due to the technical constraints of the hardware, which was never designed to handle sprite-based animations. As time wore on, Novatrade made life for those working on the project hell. With a minimal amount of resources committed to start with, and those resources slowly being moved to other projects as Novatrade took larger and larger chunks of the Mario money and reallocated it to their own games, things were not looking good. The team assigned to Super Mario's Wacky Worlds eventually would grow tired of working on a project after it became clear Novatrade never intended to finish it. One by one, they left the company, killing the game with their departure as Philips caught on and pulled the funding. It's a sad story of money, fraud, and corruption, ensuring a game would never see release. The only silver lining is that a few prototypes have leaked to the public, forever preserving the work that was accomplished and showing off what could have been the most promising CDI game to never see release. The final game in their trilogy was all but forgotten and undiscussed until 2014 when a developer who worked on the game posted a reply to a forum thread that had sat unanswered for 8 years. The game was called Mario Takes America and was developed by Canadian startup Sigum. It was an ambitious project that aimed to mimic the style of Who Framed Roger Rabbit by using the same animation in Hotel Mario to represent the characters and placing them over footage taken in real locations. A number of levels were on rails experiences, including a New York skyscraper helicopter ride and a Louisiana Bayou speedboat race. Over the next two years, six of the seven planned on-rail stages, plus a number of additional levels focusing on platforming were finished. The project was cutting edge and overly ambitious, creating a number of issues related to the CDI's memory restrictions. This made it nearly impossible to complete sections of the game on time, as intended, 
and within budget. Feeling the game was a lost cause, Phillips pulled funding and cut their losses. The game, however, wasn't quite dead. Sigum would continue development on the project, replacing all Mario references with ones from the Sonic series in hopes that Sega would pick it up. It's unknown how far these negotiations went, as the company wouldn't last much longer, declaring bankruptcy shortly after, with all assets being seized by the Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce. Today, there is word that a short making of documentary was put together during the creation of the game, and that copies of it, along with the nearly finished game, still exist. If true, there's a real possibility of seeing what would have been at some point in the future. When I think about obscure games, not much comes close to Urban Murder Files Episode 1. Even though the game was released for the CDI, it's almost as if the game never existed. No photos, videos, or reviews remain in any public form. The game was a point-and-click adventure that oddly enough had a sequel in the works. It was cancelled in 1997 as support for the system was discontinued. What really makes the story interesting is that with the launch of the ill-fated Ouya, the developer once again reformed the original company called Omnibell and announced a re-release of Episode 1 along with the release of Episode 2. Issues with licensing fees and royalties led to the project being scrapped with neither game releasing for the Ouya or any other console. 3DO had Plumbers Don't Wear Ties and CDI had Crime Patrol? That's the typical comparison. Actually, there is another game that stands more comparable to Plumbers Don't Wear Ties and was fairly popular when released spawning a sequel. The game, Voyeur, an experience with similar play mechanics to Night Trap along with the simulated voyeurism angle, but with more legit adult themes earning it a well-deserved M rating. The CDI sequel was rumored to be finished even though it never released, but nothing surfaced leading to doubts by many as to if it had ever been in development. In 2007, this one was discovered, but it was a rare case on the CDI that required having both discs to start the game, meaning it couldn't be tested. In 2013, both discs for the game were dumped online with the following message. Today, I saved a box with CDI games from the trash at work. I don't have much knowledge about CDI, so I don't know if there's anything really interesting. The box was a mixed bag of seemingly retail, test, beta, and burn CDR disc. I don't know all the games work, especially the CDR versions. My 21T CDI 30 player, the TV one with built-in CDI, which I also saved from the trash at work a few years ago, seems to have some disc reading problems, even with the retail disc I tried. I need to check if there's something I can do about that. Unfortunately, rare games ending up in the trash heap is a common story, so I remain thankful every time I hear of someone rescuing a piece of history and putting it back in the hands of the public to enjoy. That's it for now. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Feel free to leave a positive or negative comment letting me know your thoughts. If you would like to chat or keep up to date on channel-related news, follow me on Twitter at Genovi. And until next time, you've been watching Retro Impressions.